thank you, Jeroen. Thank you very much for that generous introduction. And it's wonderful to see all of you. It's actually a really nice view from up here. I have to say, so much has been said that is in what I want to say, but it's wonderful because I, I like to think of myself as pulling it all together. Thank you, first of all, to the family, the NORAD family here, uh, led by you, Board Vegar. It is wonderful to see you and to have this conference with these critical words. And I love how everybody has woven them into their, their remarks in some way or another. Bjorg Sencha also, thank you so much for your wonderful remarks uh, here earlier. Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs and other members present. I also want to acknowledge, I actually have friends in the audience. My dear colleague, Caroline Lesser is here and good friends, especially ladies and gentlemen who are in this audience, who for the last two decades have introduced me and my family to the best of Norway. I love them and I want to mention them and if they are next to you, give them a little pat. Uh, Marit Begerev is here, Halle Johan Hansen is here, Morten Eriksson is here, and I'm sure others. Thank you so much for being here. It really is a pleasure for me to share some reflections with you today, uh, but also to pay tribute, I must say, to the past and the present of NORAD's work. You have shown courage and innovation, and I have been witness to that in your partnerships, and I really hope, actually, by being here, that you continue to be guided by those principles in this crucial decade. It's actually less than a decade, we now know, is less than seven years remaining, because the truth of the matter is, the hard work ahead will require every ounce of our innovation, our commitment, and our courage. Today, as a human family, we do find ourselves facing the greatest challenge of our time, the climate crisis. We are at once faced by uncertainty, inequity, and urgency, like never before. And to make it through all of this, our narrative has to start with this reality, that people poverty and inequality have got to be at the center, at the heart of how we meet this moment. Because the choices we make today will impact generations to come. Transitions will impact generations to come. We have the science we need, and for all intents and purposes, we even have the solutions, as we have heard, that we need to respond. But yet, for whatever reason, we are not moving fast enough and we are not doing nearly enough. And I suspect that's also why this gathering is themed human nature. Surely, as a human family, we can do better. But over 40 years ago, NORAD actually made a bet on a small grassroots movement in Kenya, the Greenbelt Movement. It was a bet on grassroots action it was a bet on local leadership that catalyzed community mobilization and the mass planting of trees across Kenya. Not only were landscapes completely transformed, but over those decades, the Greenbelt Movement mobilized thousands of women groups and planted over 50 million trees. Today, as the Managing Director at the World Resources Institute for Africa and Global Partnerships, we are also acutely aware that in the coming years, we have got to turbocharge initiatives like these. We have got to invest in people, nature, and climate together. Transitions in all sectors of cities, food, energy, water, you name it. Transitions that will usher a new era in which people have access to economic opportunities and a much better quality of life. And a world in which resources are protected and nature is restored. A world in which global emissions are sharply in decline. And this path is not always obvious, and we may still feel like it's far enough. But here is the good news. Today we have all the knowledge we need, and we have all the tools we need to get there. So improving human well-being and delivering the basic needs 
is the most important development imperative, certainly for the African continent. And looking at Africa from these, that lens means that it has to be very clear that climate is also about development. And I think everyone who has come up on stage thus far has made that point. We also know this, that Africa has the highest levels of poverty. We all know those statistics. And that actually renders us more and more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. There are over 600 million Africans today who do not have access to electricity. And as we see changes in other parts of the world, that number as a percentage of global energy poverty only gets higher. But at the same time, we know that Sub-Saharan Africa has some of the highest levels of potential for renewables. We know that Africa has enormous potential as a gr the fastest growing youth population in the world, a bulge that is actually the envy of countries around the world. And talk about Africa's forests. Ladies and gentlemen, the mighty Congo forest that is the healthiest tropical forest in the world today, sequestering more carbon than any other and remaining a net carbon sink, the only net carbon sink of all tropical forests in the world. Development in Africa today, therefore, has to be about addressing the impacts of climate change, protecting critical ecosystems and biodiversity, and also unleashing economic growth. You cannot today disentangle those. And I'm so happy to hear all of our speakers mention that link. This is not a choice. This is an absolute necessity. And at WRI, we are also learning that a carbon-intensive structural transformation is actually not even necessary for Africa. We can chart a new development pathway. We must actually chart a new development pathway. And in this rapidly transforming global economy and global e ecosystem, we have got to look to renewables, for example, in the energy sector. But we also know that the truth about renewables as Vanessa Nakate was talking about it, is not necessarily as straightforward. African countries do have the opportunity to advance in renewables. But here is an interesting fact about renewables in Africa. There is no other sector on the African continent that simultaneously demonstrates great potential, but at the same time is facing significant challenges. We know by 2030, because of the gains that have been made in India, Latin America, and Southeast Asia, 85% of those living in Africa will have no access to electricity. That in itself is a massive demand for renewables. Let's look at the supply side. By 2040, and this always amazes me, Africa's solar potential alone, Africa's solar potential will be 19 times what the global demand for energy is. 19 times. We're not talking about hydro, we're not even talking about geothermal, just from solar. So Africa's renewable resources are immense. And so Vanessa is right when she says that we should be considering renewables for Africa as an imperative. But why isn't it already happening? The question really is, why is there no rush to invest in renewable sector in Africa today? It is a paradox, and to understand this paradox is also to begin to identify the areas where true partnership is needed. The areas, ladies and gentlemen, where we must look forward and invest. According to CPI, the Climate Policy Initiative, between 2021 and 2022, Financial commitments in renewables in Africa told a very sad story. While investments in renewable energy systems totaled 9 to 10 billion, investments in fossil fuel investments, as you heard, were around 29 billion. And that is not inclusive of the 37 billion in fossil fuel subsidies alone. There is a clear mismatch in priorities and signals. And at that level, you can see very quickly where 
we are investing far less in renewables than we in in fossil fuels than we are in renewables but with the level of demand and supply as ripe as they are on the continent there is another reason and there are other reasons why we are not seeing a fast investment and this is about two critical issues number one is the cost of capital african countries today access capital at an average cost of 20 to 30 percent. And we can go to a country like the Democratic Republic of Congo, where capital is at around 40 percent. Northern economies like here in Norway access at rates of 5 percent or even less, and that makes the case for renewables that much greater. In Africa, there is simply no case to be made at the current cost of capital for renewable energy investments at scale. And that is a tragedy. We have to work on it. And I'm so glad that at this conference, we will be looking at that issue. And, and the, the papers that we've seen come out that will be discussed here address this question directly. Because here's the surprise. At the current cost of, of capital for Africa today, the most profitable source of energy is a diesel generator. Finally, and this really has to do with the demand and uptake of, gener of, of the energy generated. We can generate the energy, but we also have to invest in the uptake. Who will invest in this energy? Across the African continent today, a small number of utility customers account for the lion's share of the energy produced. In Kenya, for example, 5% of customers generate 70% of the income to the utility. You can see very quickly how this is not necessarily profitable yet. So expanding the grid, expanding, lowering the cost of capital are some of the most important incentives that have to be put in place to make renewables a shoe in for the African continent. And this example bears out very nicely in the Song We Stand report that we'll be seeing today. Addressing that cost of capital in Africa is crucial to unlocking the energy revolution. Ladies and gentlemen, in an area when the world is struggling to address existential crises in climate change and biodiversity loss, Africa can be a beacon of hope. We know that, we know that. And we can play a leading role in global cooperation, but it will take solidarity and partnership to make that happen. I would never have imagined that these words spoken right here in Oslo, close to 20 years ago now, would be so true today as they were in 2004. In her Nobel Peace Lecture, my mother, Wangari Mathai, uttered these words that I find so poignant and that I leave you with today. Today, we are faced with a challenge that calls for a shift in our thinking so that humanity can stop threatening her life support system. We are called to help the earth heal her wounds and in the process, heal our own. Indeed, to embrace the whole of creation in all of its diversity, its beauty and its wonder. This will happen if we see the need to revive our sense of belonging to the larger family of life. And in the course of history, she said, there comes a time when humanity is called to shift to a new level of consciousness, to reach a higher moral ground, a time when we have to shed our fear and give hope to each other. That time is now. Thank you.